The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss, bringing you the 11th collection of scores from website subscribers for the 2021 Orchestration Challenge. This is just so exciting. I'm, we're actually getting closer to the end. There are six more videos to go, including this one, in this particular category. And there's only about, I think, maybe another on my docket anyways, about another 28 or so scores uh, from Patreon subscribers. And yeah, it's it's really, really getting exciting. And, and, um, <laughs> and what's really great is that people are keeping the energy up. And all I can say about that is please, everybody watching this video, if you are one of the people on this video, <laughs> Um, one of your entries is on this video, please leave a comment for your fellow members of this collection. Uh, if you were to leave a comment for each of them, that would be great. I'm seeing some kind of collective rundowns of other people's works, and I think that that's really excellent. And I hope that people are actually reading the comments that people made. They're, they're pretty much all supportive. Every once in a while, I'll see somebody say, well, I would have done this or that a little differently. But I have yet to see somebody say something unkind. So, um, yeah, just everybody is really kind of taking the same tack that I do in their comments being constructive and supportive and just, you know, giving feedback rather than criticism, right? So please keep it going because, <clears throat> you know, at this point... Um, I'm not really getting really kind of punch drunk yet or, or giddy or whatever from the excitement of doing, of uh, evaluating score after score. I'm managing to work in some, some time to sort of let myself um, recharge in between bursts of evaluations. But all the same, uh, all those comments that are left really keep me going more than anything else. You know, the more productive I can see people taking their own evaluations further on and, and talking about each other's scores, the better, the stronger this is. So with that, let's jump into Luke's score here. So Luke, you have contributed in the past, and it's just delightful that you're able to participate in this particular round of evaluations. And I hope that you are around for the next uh, orchestration challenge in 2022, because that will be, as I've been mentioning, as I've been teasing throughout this, uh, this, these evaluations, that is going to be something completely different, just you know, different from anything that we've done so far. Um, and, and I think satisfying to pretty much every everybody out there who's participated before. So let's look at your score here. Um, a couple of things. Now, Luke, if you've been watching some of the other evaluations, then you'll probably already be saying to yourself, I think he's going to say something about the harp. So I am going to say something about the harp. In this context here, the harp has really got no chance. Um, and anytime you've got this much heavy brass going on and such bright 
uh, winds and and pizzicato strings. The harp basically is is an asterisk. You know, it 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 really has no it has no role of its own. Maybe the harpist sitting in their chair can actually hear what they're playing, but nobody in the audience will be able to, right? So my cardinal rule of orchestrating is never score something that the audience can't hear at all, that doesn't contribute to the sound. Here I would say uh, the pizzicato alone is enough to overwhelm any kind of sound that the harp has got, if it were not for the other instruments as well. And then right in here, this is kind of nice, but still, fortissimo strings will bury the harp. If the harp were an octave higher, or maybe even two octaves higher, then it would be more audible. But in this context, just not at all. All right, so <laughs> um, let's think about the evaluation criteria. And through those, I will analyze other aspects of your score. The first concern is pitch weight in the upper middle register of the piano translated directly to the orchestra uh, being a concern. Now here you are broadening the scope of the orchestration all the time. We're having uh, the occasional, not the constant, lower notes in, you know, for instance, in, in these four bars and then down here and so on. And, and I, I think that that is very wise. It keeps your score from being just kind of high pitched all of the time. And that leads us to our next concern, and that is whether or not there is too much copy-pasting happening. In other words, since the thematic material is just repeating over and over again, you know, first in these four bars, two groups of two, and then the same thing again, <clears throat> whether or not the orchestrating it the same exact way twice will result in a bit of monotony for the listener. And here, you avoid that beautifully. Like, you're starting off with pizzicato uh, strings, which I'll talk about in a little bit. There's something still to fix there. Pizzicato strings and um, no lower winds or brass or strings. <laughs> then here, you bring in some really lusty <laughs> bassoons right in here and, um, and arco strings, bringing in the cellos nice and strong. And yeah, I mean, it, it all works pretty well. I, I would actually give the double stop here to the cellos rather than the violas. I feel that the, you know, the, the cellos just have the greater sound here. So if you really want to match with these bassoons, then I think that the, um, that double stop cellos will work really beautifully here. And then the violas can just uh, bear down all of their strength on that single E right here. So the concern that I've got is right here. You have pizzicato violins <clears throat> at fortissimo, and you've got accented brass at forte, and accented winds at fortissimo. Now, did you notice in the mock-up, you can just barely hear the pizzicato? I mean, it's almost not there at all. Well, you know, that is actually what is going to happen live. So I think that the pizzicato here needs to be pizzicato with accents, right? And if anything, the, the brass needs to back off on their accents. So if you do that, then, you know, pizzicato with accents, winds with accents, brass without the accents then I think that there is a chance of the pizzicato coming through nicely. I like the treatment of the melody here. Um, you know, yep, up, up, um. We've got our triple octave, piccolo, atu flutes, uh, atu oboes plus second trumpet. Now here, there's absolutely zero reason for this to be second trumpet unless you, you yourself, Luke, are a second trumpet player <laughs> and you're going to be playing in the orchestra that this is, go that this is going to be performing, right? And you have plans for it and everything else. If that's the reason why you scored second trumpet here, then hats off to you, right? That's fine. But this is the second. This is not the second trumpeter's job. They they have a support role. This is the first trumpeter's job, right? Always give it to the person that has the most responsibility. So, 
I would say right in here, since the, the first trumpet player has no need to take a break and, and allow the second player to take over for them because they're saving their lip up for something, they're not saving their lip up for anything. So this is their part, right? I mean, it's fun to, to give your second players a role from time to time. I mean, look at Dvorak and how he favored his second flute player. But just in practical terms, you as a developing orchestrator, developing composer, cannot guarantee you know, that kind of quality. Right? You, don't, you don't know what kind of orchestra is going to be performing your work. It could be like a regional orchestra, a community orchestra, um, even a student orchestra, right? And if you give the if you give the second if you give this melody to the second trumpet uh, in a student orchestra, then like the second player may barely be able to play like this at all, right? They might they might be the student of the first, right? In which case, what do you do if the first player is just sitting there itching to play this and the second player can barely handle it? So really, just play it safe. Give yeah. You know, if you if you just want a single trumpet player here, give it to your first player. And like without the accents here, then the little trumpet line will not overwhelm the oboes, right? So oboes accented staccato, first trumpet, let's say uh, staccato. Then there, there, that'll be a nicer blend, right? It'll still be really heavy on the trumpet compared to the oboes, but all the same, it'll be a better blend. Now, you know, here I've already commented on this. Um, I see what you're doing here. So you're, you're um, setting this up so that the player has a chance to play this like non divisi So I would say in this, in this instance, you don't need the B on the bottom because the B is already being covered by the second violins and the second violins can play this very loudly as a double stop because they've got the open E on top and then they can just finger the B on the A string, right? And so they've got a really powerful double stop, just, you know, that can be scorching, hammering. So you don't need this B down here. So just get rid of that and then you can have all the power, like you don't have to go divisi here, which the players might want to do, right? So if you have just B here, this double stop, just E here, and then this double stop as, a, as an E fifth, then I think you have a beautiful lineup here. And then of course the melody, you just drop, <coughs> excuse me, you drop the trumpets and you just have uh, first and seconds doubling the flutes and oboes with the piccolo on top and that works beautifully. So, all right, now <laughs> let's talk about uh, the next concern in our evaluation criteria, the melodic development soaring quite high and the accompaniment figures covering a wide range of pitches. So, so how have you interpreted that? Let's start with the melodic curve here. Piccolo. Yeah, I mean that's great. And then you have the the first violins playing from below. So, I think that this will come through really well, right? If you have Atu flutes on top. And especially piccolo on top, they will they will not get as absorbed by the the overtones of the strings. Like there was always a risk with a uh, flute, <clears throat> especially solo flute, having its timbre absorbed by very emphatic fortissimo strings or forte strings underneath it. Right, but there's more of a chance here. And you know, just telling the marcato and. Uh, you know, the whole nature of this, the crescendo at the end and so on. I mean, the the flute players will probably play out really nicely. Now, uh, just a question. Yeah, okay. All right. Never mind. Never mind. I was just checking something on the uh, on the original score, which I've got here on another screen. So, yeah, once again, harps, you know, don't need to be there. All right, then the second treatment of the melody. This is interesting. So you really avoid uh, the realizing the very, very high melody, right? Yeah, so 
uh, the, just the thing to know that that really the the drop of of register here will really be you know it's it's not a smooth thing it's it the drop down is something that the audience is really going to hear but i mean you still have this constant line all the way through right in here in your seconds so i mean i guess it'll work all right i'm not saying it's wrong or bad or anything you have to change anything but it's but still it's just just have to watch out i really love the trade off here from bassoons to oboes. I think that's excellent, very strong. And then of course the clarinets trading off to the flutes above. It's a really, really good handling of this, at least going into this. But we, we still don't have that really, really high pitched, you know, the you're not realizing the piano music as it was originally scored. You're letting the overtones do the work and then there's just this little rip at the end. That's great. Okay, now you're putting a huge amount of weight here on the downbeat. Right, so it's a little strange because the phrase is ending here, right? But there's so much weight on the downbeat that it almost feels like you're beginning the next phrase, but that's not true, right? The next phrase starts on the second beat here. So dun dun dun, and then once again two and three and one, two and three and one, two and three and one, right? So it's just little groups that start on the second beat each time. Yeah, so just I would just think about whether or not you're overemphasizing the downbeat here with so much huge weight, right? I, I don't know. I mean, it it it's it feels it feels all right. It's just whether or not they you know just just think about the rhythmic phrasing in here and come to your own conclusions. Um, there's a concern right in here in my criteria whether or not the upper middle register continuing on feeling relentless, but. What's nice here is that you keep the uh, you keep the colors differentiated enough, right? So like here you've got a, a nice tutti, wind strings and brass, and a little percussion and so on. And then we have the little the little alternating passages with more or less just winds and uh, winds and strings with a little bit of horn stuck in there, which by the way works really nicely. And then you end up with a big hit, and then you go to just winds and horn so you get a little bit of relief for the ear and and this is all scored pretty nicely you could have chosen to jump between groups you know winds brass strings or whatever just to have a little bit of interplay between the groups but there's no there's no requirement of that or anything it's just a just a thought of how to even break things up further right in here you're trading off between the uh, first and second and then uh, third and fourth, it's, it's kind of unnecessary, really. I mean, you could just leave the whole thing to just two players, and that, that way the same two players stay focused on the task, right? Rather than just chucking this in here. But, you know, if you, you, know, if you kind of want the sense of interplay, then why isn't there interplay between different instruments in stating the melody, right? So that's another thing to think about. Now, one thing I realize I just breezed over is the treatment of the accompaniment figure and I like the way that you keep it simple here just first clarinet and staccato viola right in here and just you know touch of second violin some oboe and so on the horns I think that that's a that's a nice solid substitution for what happens in the left hand of the piano and then right in here this is pretty cool um it's a little it's a little underpowered though, right? Because you're just about to do this big push. Right, it would be nice if the accompaniment had a little bit more power in here than just these three instruments, right? I I don't know. I mean, it just just feels a little um not weak, but just like, you know, compared to this nice double octave statement right in here, you know, maybe this could be a little stronger. And that just leaves our final section here, the maintaining the driving staccato, transitioning smoothly into the next passage. So if you were intending to go for a very heavy, um, you know, lower string kind of passage right in here, then that's a really good transition. I like the multi marcato. It's just really, really simple uh, transcription of the 
um, of the original material from the piano, right? And there's really kind of no need to uh, to get fancy with it. Yeah, a little pizzicato at the bottom too. So this could have easily gone forward with this treatment of just strings, you know, boom, 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 and then you know, like, and when that finishes, maybe have bassoon come in, yeah, and then the horns and the trombones answer, and then the English horn comes in, uh, which you didn't put in yet, but that's all right. Right. So there's, there's like you totally. I can see how this could lead forward into a bunch of different ideas. Except just the harp has got no chance here, right? So the harp could be heard alongside these these uh, fortissimo strings, but not alongside, right? Next to it, not unison with them, right? So like it's just better like to have the harp above, and and maybe even playing patterns or or some other kind of thing, big strums or or things that are not going to be absorbed by the very strong overtones of the violins, especially the lower they go, right? So just try to avoid this kind of scoring. If the harp was like mezzo forte, <laughs> and there wasn't a big crescendo here, then they would have a chance of being heard, right? But just using them to thicken the tone here is just doesn't it doesn't make any sense. You might as well just give that to the clarinet or something, right? If you want the tone to be slightly thicker here, because this will not come through. So yeah, so once again, don't give, don't give your player anything to do that results in them not being audible at all, right? But yeah, but really great score, Luke. I mean, yeah, just it's a it's of a piece with previous excellent entries, and um, yeah, just you know what you could do with the twenty twenty two entry would be great to see. So um, all I'm gonna say is just to thank you once again for entering the uh the challenge and uh yeah and watch out for that harp scoring in the face of fortissimo it's not very powerful and let's take a look at the next score now That's a great score, Peter, and I I really like the way that the mock-up sounded. It's really kind of atypical. Uh, I, I don't think you're using Note Performer there, but whether you are or not, it just has this really cool, brighter sound. Uh, maybe a little weak to some ears, perhaps. I mean, you could try this out with Note Performer. Maybe you are note using Note Performer, but it just, just feels really, really bright to me. But yeah, it, it has a, a kind of a cool sound. So let's take a look over here at this problem, okay? And if you have already heard me blab about this, anybody out there viewing this, and Peter, then I am I apologize. But the thing I mostly apologize for is not catching that this was going to be another pitfall. And this is probably something that I should have mentioned in the list of pitfalls that I had in the announcement. So if you look at the piano score down here, and I'm actually, you know, usually I would I would prefer that this were deleted. So keep that in mind for future entries, Peter, if you are able to enter in 2022 and, and going forwards. So, um, but you know, but in this case, I can take a, I can kind of show you that like the whole point here of Faya's scoring was he wanted the right hand to play an E fifth using the pointer and the pinky, and then to end up on the thumb, right? So gadung 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 gadung, right? And then right here, of course, there's the other grace note, which is going to be played at the same time, boom, 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 like sort of inside the octave by the left hand. So it's kind of a cool little technical trick. All right, <clears throat> but you have to think, right? You have got these pitches, right? And it's tied, right? The, the B comes in a little early. 
So is there a way of expressing that uh, orchestrally? And I would say, no, there isn't, right? Because what you're asking the players to do is to come in a fraction of a second early. But that doesn't really work orchestrally, right? There's a very strong downbeat, right? The, the conductor just wants everybody to go, you know, one, two, three, one, two, and three, in. And you know, some, some instruments are going to go, but um, but um, but um, but um, right? And some pre pre some players are gonna go boing 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 boing, but how is a player gonna go uh 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 uh? I mean, it's just like what is that? Like they're uh, everybody is just going to feel like the piccolo and first flute are coming in slightly ahead of the beat, right? And 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 but it, there's kind of no snap to it. Do you know what I mean? So it would have been better if like maybe this were A sharp slurring into B rather than just B, B, I mean, and there's also, it doesn't go biddy, 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 and there isn't like a, like, you haven't taken the tie out, right? So that's just a technical problem right in there that, you know, like I said, I should have caught that. So I don't blame anybody who has done this in their score, but I thought it just, you know, just to, every once in a while, since I'm seeing this mistake in quite a few scores, uh, just just to sort of stop and, and point it out and talk about why that, may or may not work, right? And, and the purpose is not to shame anybody or to say this is bad or blah, blah, blah. But it's just, you know, these lectures are just an overall look into how I, you know, how I evaluate a score, how I would get it. You know, if I were, if I were your assistant, Peter, you know, you were like some big shot film composer, which, you know, for all I know, may be the case. You know, how would I prepare your score? How would I, what would I fix in it? What would I change just to make things more coherent, right? And so that, that's one of the things that I would probably say, look, just, just have the Bs come in on the beat. It's like these other grace notes are fine. All right, so with that out of the way, <clears throat> same comments here and harp that I, I would say are a concern for the previous score that Luke had, right? So, you know, the, the big, like, even, you know, backing off here and saying, oh, well, winds are just just going to be forte and the trumpets are going to be mezzo forte and the only fortissimo instruments here are going to be the strings. So, like, if you really wanted the harp to play a role here, playing this exactly as you've scored it, everybody would have to be way down. Uh, violins would have to be mezzo forte along with the the winds and the trumpets would have to be like piano. Right? And then you could hear the harp come through. So um, what is audible uh, in this sort of situation, like with much louder scoring from everybody, is like glissandos, big rolls, big rolled chords, uh, arpeggios um, kind of going back and forth, uh, little figures on top, like above the music where, you know, where there is a bit of a slot there. Although with the piccolo way up there, it kind of is taking up that higher slot. So... It kind of messes up how much you could do. So, so just think about that, everybody. Like when you, you know, this was one of the, one of the things where I just feel there was a big hole in my twelve common errors. Just you know, scoring harp in ways that agree with everybody else, like that are just supporting everybody else when there is massive amount of weight is just doesn't work, right? Or it doesn't work for the harpist. It works for everybody else. They're fine, you know, but. You know, if, if you're not going to use the harp in a way that it can be heard, just give the harpist a break. Let them get out their smartphone and check what's going on on Facebook, right? You know, just like let them do what they're going to do. Now here, going forwards, you have this, you know, pizzicato and yet da 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 I mean, there's a tiny chance of harp coming through a little bit, but still, I mean, it's still not the kind of scoring, like just a single note here and a single note there. It really is does still even doesn't have much of a chance against the winds right in here, or you know the same note being played pizzicato. Pizzicato basically blows the harp out of the water. So you know fortissimo pizzicato, just a single eighth note from the second violins is going to be so much louder than the harp on this one note here, right? You've got, I mean, just the think of the mechanics of it. You've got say fourteen second violin players, and you've got you know playing each plucking their uh their d or g string here and you, then you've got your harpist just like a single string from the harp right it just doesn't have much there just isn't a whole lot of competition there i love the timpani in here but i'll i'll talk about those other things now okay so like let's let's get off the harp i just feel like 
like um, it, it doesn't hurt to discuss a bit of the harp's role. You know, so same thing here. Just I mean, and here you got fortissimo and all these parts, and you've got like a little forte going on for the harp. Now, if these were huge rolled chords, even hand over hand, you know, left hand starting the chord and then the right hand and the left hand stopping on top, like bryam, 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 like you could probably hear some harp. But I mean, with this kind of rank, noisy, uh, muted trumpet to compete with, plus fortissimo wins, I just don't think that there's much chance, right? Okay, so now let's talk about some scoring. Starting with pitch weight in the upper middle register of the piano, um, you know, you kind of do sort of more or less stick to that area with a few exceptions. Like, you know, I really love this bass clarinet doubled by double bass pizzicato. Such a cool idea. Um, you know, you have the longer note and you have the punctuation of the double bass almost like a piano note, right? That's a that's a really great trick. And it's it's been used by other composers. Um, yeah, uh, so like, it, it, it just to a degree, you might want to think about like the overall arc of this music, of this screen here, right? And like whether or not things are, you know, too too much pitched above middle C, right? If there's just too much weight up there. I mean, you know, you can see the piano score just really stays above middle C for the longest time, right? So so what does that what effect does that have on the orchestration altogether, right? It just makes everything start to feel I mean it starts it's very bright and exciting at first and then after a while, you know, by the time you get to here, it's kind of relentless, uh, as as one of my criteria will mention, which we'll get to in a second. So, so I would say like it's not that you've done anything wrong. It's just like what are the what are the proportions of your overall score, right? If you decide to pursue this, make it you know like improve it, maybe even take it further and see if you can get somebody to perform it, right? That that is something that you might want to consider, and that just takes us to the next concern, which is thematic material repeating often, possibly sounding repetitive if orchestrated exactly the same way twice, right? So, if we look at the way that you've scored things, uh, there really isn't much of a change between the first four bars and the second four bars, except for just kind of throwing in a couple extra notes here, English horn, clarinets, and so on. As I said before, bass clarinet doubling with this pizzicato in here. And then, of course, you've got this stroke here, boom, by the timpani. So, I, you know, if you threw in another one here, boom, right, it would just match with everybody else's. I, I like the fact that you keep it soft. So just to, to evaluate the overall scoring, um, you know, I mean, it, it works pretty well. And, and I see what you're trying to do here. Uh, muted horn, muted first horn, mezzo forte, plus oboes. And you've taken away the accents so that the, uh, the trumpet is basically just blending with the oboes. Okay, that's, that's all fine. Um, that's all great. But then you got winds, and you know, the winds are below the strings, and I think that we're getting into too much. Um, we're getting into too much uh, dynamic mixing here. I think you should try to keep it as simple as possible, right? So, um, I, I think that like having the strings forte and the winds forte and everybody else forte, and, and maybe the snare drum could be mezzo forte and the trumpets could be mezzo forte. I think that that would balance fine. I don't think that you need to gild the lily, right? By just having like, you know, foreground, middle ground, background. I, I think after a while, it's just, you know, I mean, the problem with it is just like players reading what's on their score, you know, having having your snare drum player at fortissimo and your glockenspiel player like a, just a, a few feet away in the in the percussion section and reading this part as forte and hearing the snare drum player part, play their part as fortissimo and saying, geez, that's, you know, assuming that this guy is playing forte and thinking, wow, they, you know, that snare drum player sure is playing a loud forte. Maybe I should play forte according to that louder idea as well, right? And which just ends up with more raised hands at rehearsal or an overly strong glockenspiel part, right? So, so I would say just like, 
try to avoid too much dynamic mixing. Try to you know try to have more um, more uniform dynamics when you can, and and then also like you know, make the orchestration do the work of the dynamic mixing, right? Using the stronger and weaker registers of the instruments to balance them as opposed to like just tweaking and going through a bunch of different parts and saying, you know, piano, your piano, he's mezzo forte and so on. I mean, sometimes it's unavoidable and I'm not going to go through every single little thing that you did here, but just in general, right? Watch out for that. So that leads us to the next, I, the next, uh, uh, two criteria, and that is melodic development soaring quite high um, and the accompaniment figures covering a wide range. So um, it's kind of interesting here, you, you know, you're doing the bum 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 bum, that, that nice pizzicato right in here, and then here you're going yet da 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 dum, right? And I mean, it's like, it's kind of a nice blend. What I would say is that, like, if you're gonna have this much weight in your accompaniment in the winds, and all you've got here is pizzicato in the strings, then in just excuse me in just in just the second violins, I think you need a little bit more support from other instruments. Maybe like viola could be doubling what's going on in the English horn and clarinet parts, All right? Okay, uh, but just 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 needs to be a little more bit more weight of plucking in here because I I think you know the way that you scored it, the oboes are actually going to be the loudest thing in the you know oboes and and clarinets plus English horn are going to be louder than the pizzicato. All right. Um, and, you know, and respect respecting the fact that you did balance these fortissimo and that's and that's forte and this is mezzo forte, but all, you know, even at that, right? Like what's what like the recommendations I'm giving to you are based on a on like balancing things with more uniform dynamics. All right, so here we've got uh, piccolo and uh, two flutes, and here they're they're unison, and then here you split off. Okay, so that's great. So here you have to tell me whether or not you're continuing on with just the first player, right, as it sort of seems to suggest, or whether this is a two. So like any time you go to us, like any time you've been dividing the voices like this, like two separate voices on the same staff, and then you go to a single voice in the next bar, you have to tell me, like, you know, so if this is one, just write a one right here, okay? So just so I know. And this is really great, the way that you deal with the melodic development getting too high, possibly. All right. Yeah, and, and this is cool, the way that you jump down and then you let the, the um, overtones do the work. And yeah, this is a little conservative, but it works great. Then we're back to this and then so on and then going on and analyzing the same two criteria going forward yeah just just looking at this the way that this is scored you've got a lot of tones that are going to be um be sustained and accented in the playing and then here you just have this you know just a just a few stray notes of pizzicato in the string so you need to add more weight of pizzicato i think bring in your violas they can help out right Okay, and then this is really nice, just textbook, I would say, you know, to this whole challenge. And then, of course, like the clarinets, and here you sort of drop, one of them drops out, and, you know, I don't know if you need to do that, right? Now here, you you are also dropping out in the, the violins, and I, what I'm worried about here is that there will be, like, the gap right in here will... Um, be a little too audible, right? Just the loss of strength. So if you did what you did before here and just dropped the line down to join the second violins and then ran up to that E and then let the combined sound of the of the violins do the work of, of adding overtones that were uh, realized by the flutes, the flute family above, flute and piccolo, then I think it just will have a, um, you know, it just will have a more uniform sound and especially like bringing in glockenspiel there right it's like you're kind of adding your you know uh, it will keep the idea from just like oh suddenly there was piccolo and and glockenspiel wow instead of oh there was this beautiful line that was rising through the orchestra and and then it's got really silvery at the end right 
So it's just, just trying to keep uh, to keep big signboards with big arrows pointing at things out of your score, right? You don't want something that's saying, hey, guess what started here, right? You want it to be more subtle. Like, like in fact, you could start, say, you know, if everybody was marked forte or fortissimo, you could start back here, piano, and then crescendo to whatever, you know, fortissimo here, right? And then, then the line gets progressively more silvery rather than just suddenly the suddenly the glockenspiel is starting on the downbeat right really dividing up the line rather than it being this beautiful line that runs free and isn't paced by anything by any punctuation all right and that takes us to <laughs> um this part possibly sounding relentless if um you know if there's no textural contrast. Well, there is textural contrast to an extent, right? I mean, there's a lot of things that are being used again, you know, like the some of the similar instruments used for, um, you know, in similar ways, right, in both of these sections, right? So there is a sense of relentlessness here, right? So, so it, just once again, proportions, right? If you can, you know, say you return to this and perhaps you make this bigger in scope of pitches, right? And then dropping down to a, a smaller sound picture here, um, you know, maybe you could run up to fortis, fortissimo here, and then you could continue on forte, right? With mezzo forte brass behind it, and then have fortissimo uh, harp. Now that might seem like a contradiction, right? So you have fortissimo harp, forte strings and winds, and mezzo forte brass. Didn't you say something about not trying you know trying to avoid having a foreground middle ground and background well in this case it really is just a, a foreground and a background right with um with uh, achieving a blend right with with um nice strong winds and and brass and then the the excuse me nice strong strings and winds with the brass not overwhelming them sort of kind of balancing and then but not too loud so that the harp can play a little bit louder, right? Another thing too is like, you know, snare drum and harp together, the snare drum will always win. So any any kind of percussion that is just really punchy or really has a big boom to it will, will you know, the punch of the snare will slightly swallow the sound of the plucking of the strings. Uh, a big booming kind of like, like timpani or bass drum, the the sort of booming resonance will absorb the sustain sound, right? So you have kind of that. So uh, percussion and harp, I mean, they do work together, but they just really have to be balanced carefully. Yeah, and and so like with this sforzando, it almost seems like you're suggesting uh, maybe possibly like a non arpeggiando, right? Just like a real rip, or you know, or if it's arpeggiando, to be just really fast and abrupt and punchy. So and and that's also like in in a big texture. The slower the roll, the more audible the harp, right? Uh, and you want to get you don't want it to get too slow, uh, but just like you know, big rippling rolling chord, um, using as many hands as possible against a strong texture is a better option. And then just like you know, really abrupt cluster of of tones which get absorbed into the sound of the other instruments. Now, you know, our last concern is maintaining a driving staccato transitioning smoothly to the next passage. So this really does feel like it is headed somewhere. You know, nice doublings. We got the, um, we got the flutes and the firsts, right? And the, the firsts and seconds doubling each other. And then the, in the harmony part, we've got first clarinet. And, you know, there's really no need to just have one clarinet at the beginning, right? So like here you've got two wind instruments and you've got like one clarinet. Right, so it's okay to have two clarinets come, and then like here you're like getting even bigger with the accompaniment part, right? So um, the 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 problem that you've got here, forte, molto marcato, crescendo, right, in all parts, correct, or in this case fortissimo, and you know once again like it's better to have these um, at the same dynamic, right? Okay, the problem is that it starts off nice, and then the lower you go, the less flute you're gonna, you know, the less the flute is is 
contributing anything at all to the force of the sound in here, especially Mercado, right? So it's really the oboe, right? Uh, like you could just leave out the flutes and do ah two oboes here. And then you would get a much more supported sound out of your first and second violins here, right? But the flute, it just, it just does not have the punch, right? I mean, if you're going to take a kind of a hooty kind of sounding instrument down this far, and you'd rather have that than the warm sound of the oboe, then just really score the whole thing for two flute, excuse me, for two clarinets, right? And then you have the more hooting sound of the clarinet on both parts. But uh, yeah, just the, this is not going to contribute very much, if at all, like, and especially like just one flute player, right? It's trying to support 30 string players in the, that flute's weakest register, right? So think about that, like, whereas the oboe gets nice and pungent as it gets lower, right? Once it gets down to, you know, playing down to this E and this D, it's got a fat, fat sound. It's going to give you all the crescendo that you want, right? Whereas the, just the flute gets weaker and weaker and weaker as it gets lower. All right, so those are all things to think about. So, you know, once again, Peter, I mean, I'm not saying this is a bad score or anything like that, but these are all little areas that you could fix to make it work better in a live situation, right, with, with real players and so on. So just, I would just say, simplify the approach to the dynamics. You know, just really try to keep it like a couple different dynamics, like the most traditional one and big forte kinds of scoring like this where you really want the instruments to blend together is to really you know is to have the winds and the strings be the same dynamic that's fine but to have the brass you know maybe take the brass back a notch right now there are ways of scoring where everything can be forte everything can be fortissimo and just all of the instruments are in their strongest registers and you don't need to make any compromises with the brass and it can be also be a tutti right so i'm not saying that you have to you have to do that in a 2 T, but that's just one way. Like if you, if you are experimenting with balancing textures, that's the balance. And I would just say leave the harp out unless it's doing some of the things that I prescribed. You know, like big rolls, glissandos, uh, figuration, that kind of thing. You know, big wide swooping arpeggios. Those things will come through the music, uh, more or less. But yeah, but they, but you know, doubling very loud accented textures, accented notes will just kill the, whatever the harpist is trying to do, right? And it's a shame because you have these, you know, cool, these big cool chords and so on. All right, well, um, thanks so much, Peter, for entering this challenge. It's it's just, you know, great to get a score from somebody new. I, I think you this is your first, if, if, if it isn't, I apologize. Um, but I think this is your first time entering this challenge, and it's really great to get an entry from you. It's, you know, some really fun scoring, some great ideas in here, really nice energy and colors, as I said before. Just, you know, like you keep things bright, and, you know, as I mentioned, you know, that for, from some perceptions that could possibly be a little wearing on the ear, but but it's scored so nicely that, you know, that it's you know, nothing that I would worry about too much. It's just like long term, how many times can this piece repeat? You know, repeated listenings, repeated playings, you know, how much variance can you bring into the score to, you know, to possibly maybe expand things, um, um, you know, create more variety, more um, almost, you know, a sense of a sense of structure within a structure. Right. So so but great entry. Really, really loved it. Now on to the next one. Okay, Thomas, that is one massive score. So I have a lot of um, I have a lot of feedback for you. Uh, I promise that I'm not going to be too harsh. <laughs> uh, us Thomases need to stay together. However, uh, I, I am going to probably be suggesting a lot of different changes and and kind of different ways of thinking about things. So please don't take that personal. I, I think that this is a terrific effort. All right. But these are just a, a few possible things to kind of, um, you know, 
kind of supercharge your craft and and get you more um, you know thinking about more different things. All right, now um, you have probably <laughs> been listening all along to the past two evaluations and thinking, oh no, I know what Thomas is going to say. All right, so but I, I have to say it. So um, yeah, so yeah, the the harp just has like no chance of being heard at all anywhere in here. Like this is all. I mean, in fact, the lower the scoring in a fortissimo passage, the less harp you're going to hear. Just like brass, like the lower the harp gets, the kind of the 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 more different the projection is. Now, I'm not going to say the weaker it is, right? Because a harpist's low strings can fill up a room, but they are so easily overwhelmed by higher pitches and you know, they just really you know they're 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 not really weaker in projection but they just don't have the ability to cut through things they kind of enter the ambiance of the room rather than you know you know when when other things are playing the like the lower strings of the harp just become you know just become part of the texture they just don't have much power on their own now here there's sort of middle range scoring but you know, you got these octaves, and it just is not really scored in a way that the harp is going to be doing anything loud enough, right? So just better to let the harpist uh, just take a break here. Um, you know, what could be heard? Well, you know, if it's like here, you go to mezzo forte in the timpani. If everybody went to mezzo forte here, right, and the harp did things that were more capable of being heard. Like you know, like glissandos, uh, figure in, figuration, you know, like patterns, um, big rolled chords, big arpeggios, kind of going back and forth. Uh, then you could hear the harp, right? But you know, anytime there is powerful brass, timpani, you know, it just absorbs the sound of the harp horribly, right? And and the harpist is just kind of wondering why they showed up, right? So if the if this entire piece were scored this way with the harp coming in on two T's, then you know you just might as well, you know, if there was any player that needed to be cut for that session, just cut the harp and don't worry about it, right? Okay. Um I'm I i do not know what instrument this is. Um percussion you're saying here is this castanets or snare drum or I mean it's it's I think just a a, a blank a blank percussion staff equals snare drum. So I'll assume that it's snare drum. Okay, <laughs> so one other little detail. Now, there was a tie across uh, these two eighth notes because Faya was thinking about how the left hand would be first playing the E and then playing the B. So they're playing the E with their pinky finger and playing the B with their pointer and then coming back to the pinky finger and hitting it again while the pointer was holding down. And that's why he tied the eighth notes. But there is no need for you to do the same thing, right? So this really is all that you need to do, right? You don't need to have that fancy tied eighth, right? It's just distracting. It messes up the player's concentration, right? They don't, they don't need the... because they're not playing piano, right? So... All right, um, and I th was there, there was some other little detail to look at before. Oh, it'll come to me. I'll. Uh, I hope I'll remember it, <laughs> or maybe I'm thinking of something else. Okay, so my overall comment about this is that it is just massive, right? And part of the massive sound that you've got here is you've got so much weight on the lower register. You've got timpani. You've got your uh, lower heavy brass all just plowing away at these uh, at these low B's. You got low B in the double bass. You got the contra bassoon, and then this this atu biom 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 biom, right? And and the interesting thing is that you are underscoring the dominant of the chord, not the root, right? You're underscoring the fifth. So you know it's like a it's like a slash chord. It's like um it's like E over B, right? And so that you know the sound of that, uh, uh, the or the the harmonic consequences of that are huge, right? Just like really pushing at that at the five on, on you know in the bass, uh, because like you know th this is like one of those things, sort of like parallel fifths that you know people 
like we're, we're careful about using. It's you know like there was somebody made a comment on my I think on my defending Beethoven uh, video a few years ago or no no it was uh, my Bartok um, uh, orchestration lesson and, and you know I, I basically had said well you know parallel fifths are exposed and sort of you know so the ear kind of will have a problem hearing the overtones you know, from exposed parallel fifths. And so somebody thought I was dissing parallel fifths or, you know, sort of trying to like make a rule about it or something, you know. And then I was distressed to, to see when I went back there today to answer an additional comment, which also sort of seemed to think that I was saying that, um, that like that the original comment had gotten like 13 likes, but you know, I'll, I'll uh, that doesn't bother me that much because the video got 1500 likes. So, you know, that's, that's, that's fine. You know, that's, I, I, I usually only get like, you know, a few dozen likes for any popular video. So that's something, but yeah, but, um, I'm not saying that this is bad. Okay. So I'm just saying that like, there are consequences for like the overtones, like where do the overtones fall in a, in, when you throw in a bass note that is not, the tonic, right? And and so it has a it it there's a slight there's a little bit of fighting, right? Um the you know the fifth of the fifth, right? So like underlining that B, there'll be the the intimated above will be the sound of F sharp. And also the the fifth you know, so that's like that would be the uh the third harmonic, right? And then the fifth harmonic would be a D sharp, right? So those are all inherent, especially it's like, it's not a big problem, except when you really, really push the low note like this, right? Just really, really shoving that five, right? As the, as the root or not the root, but the five as that bass note, right? So anyway, so just I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but just, you know, listen, you know, if there's a reason why this feels really solid and, you know, almost just maybe to some listeners a little too solid, right? That's possibly why. It's just, it has to do with the overtones, you know, kind of fighting with the 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 overall sound of the chord. All right. But one thing is for sure, the entire concern about pitch weight being in the upper middle register of the piano um, that is not a problem because you have such a pronounced wide register of pitches in your scoring that, you know, you know, no problem about that at all. Now, the concern about thematic material repeating often, possibly sounding repetitive if orchestrated the same way throughout, that is a problem, right? Because you are so emphatic, like just these first two bars are just so strong, right? And then you do it again, and you do it again, and you do it again, right? So, like... Just to strategize here, is there a possible way of lightening up the first iteration and then leaving the second iteration really solid? Or making, you know, maybe reverse, maybe making the first one really strong and then the second one a little lighter, right? Um, just kind of as a way of bringing in some variety. Now, you know, having said that, um, you know, in terms of the scoring, it's pretty good, you know, pretty fun. It's just... You know, just like just that low B being so powerful, right? And and there have been other there have been other instances where where the chord was structured like this, the voicing was similar with a B in the bass, but I never I mean or few have been this powerful, right? With just so much solid focus on that low B. Um Yeah, so so the next question is or the next criteria are uh, melodic development soaring quite high, accompaniment figures covering a wide range. Okay, so now here, what I feel is you almost have a little bit too much weight from the strings and too little weight from the, um, from the, excuse me, you have a, almost a little too much weight from the winds and very, you know, very little comparative weight from the cellos, right? So, I mean, it's just a question of whether you need, you know, do you really need three groups of upper strings here playing the melody? Could you get by with the seconds taking the part of the firsts and then the violas playing a role here and then maybe backing off, like maybe uh, maybe lose the, the bassoons, right? Because, like, we just had a massively heavy 
uh, kind of weight in the previous four bars. And so just the bassoons just feel very weighty. And also like really underlining the root here just makes it feel very solid. And it seems to sort of pull back on the momentum of the passage, right? It just, it's really almost about this big stomping, you know, thump, thump, thump. And we don't get this, like the beautiful dancey quality, right? We're kind of missing that, right? So maybe there's just a way of lightening this up a bit, right? Maybe make the, you know, let the timpani be the one that like states all of these things and just take away the contrabassoon and then turn this into pizzicato down here in the double basses and maybe free up the violas by giving the viola part to the seconds, right? And then it just becomes lighter and more dancey. And then like there are similar strategies right in here. Yeah, it just, yeah, it just is, is very weighty, right? And then of course like, change that into quarter note, right? Okay, um, so that's the accompaniment concern. And then I talked a little bit about the melody here. And yeah, this is nice, yeah, blah, blah, da, 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 yeah, and then the flutes, uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's a little, I mean, it, this would almost be better on clarinets, right? And and like oboes and then flutes taking over or just you know maybe the uh the flute could be doubling the flutes could be doubling the piccolo right and then dropping down an octave here as you've seen in other parts and then the oboes yeah so and say like so all right all right sorry i'm, I'm getting sidetracked um okay so flutes doubling piccolo, dropping the octave here, all right? And then, um, and then clarinets playing this, and then oboes playing this lower part right in here. I think that that would work really, really well. And then of course, but then you've got the clarinets on the accompaniment part, so. Hmm, so anyways, but I mean, there's just, there. I, th I think that like the flutes right in here just are not quite strong enough, right? Upper middle register, in this big fortissimo passage, a lot of weight. I just don't think that there's a lot of, you know, there's just a, there's just not enough strength there in the flutes. So maybe this needs to be reconfigured a little bit. Yeah, and and here as well. And it's kind of strange the the sudden drop, you know, da 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 ba ba da 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 da. This really just should be a, you know, the oboe should start off an octave lower, right, and. The flute should be doubling this, and the clarinet sh or somebody should be doing this in here. So anyway, um, yeah, and this is kind of interesting. You come to a snapping ending, and then just piccolo kind of taking off. Um, this is a little strange though. Viola's running up and trading off with the first violins and then the cellos from below. So at this point, um, I'd say if you're going to go this high, trade off to the cellos right here. Uh, like this. Okay? If you're, gonna, if you're really going to take it all the way up to E. And you could even... You know, you could even start back a little further if you wanted to, like right at this C. Or, you know, you could even start back here if you wanted to, right? So, anyway. Yeah, but it's just, that's really high to go. Yeah, this is really a treble clef part, more even more than a tenor clef part. All right, now, when you got here, did you notice something about the mock-up? That it just really seemed to turn into a big, fat brass chorale, right? And that and the, the melody, the yet da 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 melody was really weak, right? And that's just because, like, you still have most parts marked forte and fortissimo, right? Uh, and the, um, the winds just don't have a chance against that real... I mean, the, the overtones of the... 
of the trumpets and trombones and horns are just basically blotting out a lot of the wind color in here. And, and of course, the strings just, you know, and, and harp have no chance at all, right? So I think that you might need to rethink this as well, really. Just put more weight in the upper register uh, right in here. It's something kind of strange with your, your horn scoring right in here. You've got four horns in F, but you're really scoring two parts, right? And I'm not giving, I'm not seeing, you know, you're saying A2 in some parts, but I'm not saying seeing A2 on each of these notes, right? So, you know, are, are these single notes or what, right? So, I mean, if these are just single notes, you might as well just go with two horns, right? And just not even bother with four horns. Just have a nice little B third right in here playing with your uh, written B third with your, uh, with your horns, right? If you've got the horns, if you've got your four horns, then you do not need to follow the whole Rimsky-Korsakov dictum of, you know, of having two two double horn parts against every you know everybody else's. You can you can spread out a little bit, right? You don't need to to follow that rule so strongly. There's I I think I I may have a video about that, um, and also the chapter a chapter in my 100 more orchestration tips book I think or 100 orchestration tips about you know the realist you know what what is really going on in terms of balance you know there's a lot of room in here you just have like these octaves and you know um, octave and a fourth and so on kinds of uh, voicings here in your trombones and really just you could have more spread out chords in the middle register uh, alongside the trombones or inside the trombones right so i mean if the if the brass sound is going to be so dominant here you might as well just make it all about the brass right just just have it mostly be brass in here and you know it's just very exciting the way you've scored it and then give the melody to brass instruments that would be my judgment about that. But I, I really like the sort of the driving staccato here in the winds, excuse me, in the strings. Uh, I think that works really nicely. It, this is a little unnecessary, right? I, mean, I don't see why you need to just double that for one bar and then drop out again. Make it more uniform. That that always works better with wind, with uh, string parts rather than just sudden having this, this sudden bright, you know, it's, it's sort of like you're throwing in this big, um, this just sudden... Um, you know, you've got your dynamic curve going along like this, and then suddenly it jumps up like a terrace, and then it jumps back down, right? That, it's, I don't know how effective that is. So anyway, so that's my, um, those are my little uh, nits that I'm picking out of your score. <laughs> but I, I really enjoyed it, Thomas. Don't get the wrong idea. You know, I really talked a lot about, like, the possible overemphasis of, you know, B in the bass and so on. Um, but you know, I mean, you do sort of change around the harmony a little bit here and there and in some parts. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, like right in here, G sharp in some parts, B in others, I'd, I'd say try to make it more uniform, right? Because the, the lower heavy brass will be louder than everybody else, right? So you're, you're this just huge fat, uh, G sharp right in here from both instruments is going to is it's going to bray out over the low B and so on. It just it just makes the bass a, a little bit, um, you know, it thickens it in some ways and it makes it a little like unstable in others. Okay, so you know, especially with this much weight, it's you know, like a lot of. Okay, so I'm just going to explain one little thing before we sign off uh, with this score, and that is. Like a lot of times, some of the advice that I'm giving on evaluations seems simplistic, right? But that is because the nature of the dynamics is forcing a simplistic solution, all right? So it's like the, the more you up the stakes dynamically and push things, push instruments to the limit, the more you run into problems of balance, and then the simpler the approach that you need to take, right? So, you know, things like this, uh, forte, heavy brass, and fortissimo, everybody else, um, is, is not a bad solution. And I'd say, like, you could also go down to forte horns. However, um, you know, there are numerous other concerns that have a complex result, but, 
you know, might have a kind of a simplified explanation of, or, or you know, that might, the, the conditions that occur when things are pushed so loudly force, you know, they kind of end up having to have a brute force kind of solution, right? So that is why some of my explanations sometimes might sound a little repetitive or, or sound a little, um, you know, a bit like pat answers, right? Um, which um, one of my children once told me <laughs> that I was giving her pat answers. Okay, and, and I really took that to heart, right? And I try not to do that. That, um, but, but yeah, just, um, you know, that's, that is the reason for some of my explanations being the way they are, all right? So with that, I will thank you for this score, Thomas. Really, really enjoyed it. I mean, just, you know, it was one of the most powerful scores just in terms of, you know, energy, muscularity, and, you know, all that. You were just really driving through the idea throughout this, and it's, and it's, that is just so exciting to me, okay? I'm, you know, um, there are a lot of things in this that you could adjust, fix, tweak, and so on and so forth, but, I mean, I would suspect that you have other projects that you would rather do and you want to get back to them, but, uh, you know, it'd be interesting to see you take on more in, in these, um, in these challenges. So, you know, think about 2022. Uh, I, I think it would be really exciting for you. Um, and of course, a just completely different, completely different frame of mind. All right, on to the next score. Hey there, Lou. Thank you so much for a really, really cool score. Now, I'm just going to talk about a few uh, scoring things in this, um, and I don't take it amiss, but we're just going to sort of look over a few things, and I'll, I'll make a few comments, a few preliminary comments about some things, okay? So, the first thing is, um, the information I'm getting from the beginning of your score, right? You're saying flute, oboe, clarinet, bassoon, horn, right? And then I'm seeing a two, right? Or I'm seeing intervals in our um, in our horns and trumpets, right? So that that's telling me that there are more than one oboe or more more than one horn and so on. So you have to say you have to put the plural in here, right? Like you have to say two flutes two oboes, uh, two B-flat clarinets, two horns in F, right? You have to tell the, um, the, the, the conductor and the score reader and the copyist what's, what is the information here, right? Now, you don't have to indicate that here. This is all fine. These abbreviations are perfect, but yeah, it's all good. But, okay, and then there's another a couple picky little things like the way that the... Um, these bar lines stop, like they, they keep going, they should actually stop here, but they keep going and they connect with the harp, and then the harp has divided bar lines, right? So uh, those are probably things you could fix. Uh, I'm not sure, this looks like it is, this looks like Dorico. Maybe that's something that you kind of need to kind of get into the architecture of Dorico and adjust or something, or maybe you can just click and drag like with Sibelius, but yeah, and then, and then right here, like first and second violins, so and they shouldn't have a gap between them. Should they should all be one uh, solid bar line? And it's a little strange here how the glissando line goes down, and then it comes down from above, right? Instead of going up, right? But this is cool, telling us the um, the tuning right there. Yeah, and, and not writing out every pitch is uh, you know just something I'm seeing a lot of writing out every pitch. You don't need to do that, right? All the harp player needs to know is this. Now, in just in terms of like, like you know, I've been giving everybody the you know the harp scoring treatment, just discussing that before diving into everything else. So I'll do that a little bit here. Um, this works fine. This will all be audible in the context of the music. 
And then um, right here, uh, I would say, like, uh, seeing the weight of everything else, and I'll talk about the balance <coughs> when I come back to this part. Um, but I would say, like, the harp should be fortissimo. If the winds, you know, if any part in the orchestra is at fortissimo, the harp should also be fortissimo if you want them to be heard. If you want the harp to be heard against strings and winds playing a chord across all different parts, then the chord needs to be rolled in the harp, right? Um, the the bigger the roll, the more audible the part, right? And if you're just like throwing in these intervals here, which won't be rolled against these um, these violins, then you know, really, the harp needs to be scored a lot higher, now, uh, a lot louder. Now, if this were all mezzo forte, which I don't think is a bad idea, which I may suggest later, and the harp were fortissimo, then it would come through really nicely. Of course, by the time you get to here, even mezzo piano in your trumpet and trombone, um, which is just enough to get, is just enough to entirely throw away the sound of the harp. Now, right in here, if you're if this scoring was a little softer, then the um, then these patterns on the harp would be a lot more audible, right? Um, but this is since this is like part of the next section, which I'm not going to evaluate. It's just a just some food for thought. All right. So now let's get back to the beginning of the piece <laughs> and talk a little bit about the um, the evaluation criteria. So. As far as the whole concern about pitch weight in the upper middle register of the piano, not a concern. You have a very, very wide scope um, of, of pitches being used. Uh, as far as the concern of thematic material possibly sounding repetitive, that is also not a concern because you're really, really changing things around. Now, before I talk about the next criteria, let's talk about the efficacy the, the, you know, of, of the way that you scored this, right? So you're just starting off really, really simple. Okay, one last little detail. Okay, Lou, you probably missed watching the um, the 12 common errors, right? And, and what was the one error from last <laughs> from last year's evaluations, last year's challenge that I wanted everybody to not do this year? It was saying A1, right? There is no A1, right? There is either tell us that you're using the first player, which is one period, or the second player, two period, or with two, right? Here you're saying ah one, so with one. Well, which with with which player, right? Well, I don't know, with one of them, right? So, so right, so it's just it doesn't make sense with one, right? With you, you may be thinking that you're using the first here, right? In which case, what do you do about ah two, right? Does that mean with the second player, right? See, so it's just a big confusing mess. Just tell us either you're using the first player or the second player. Right, which one period or two period, or you're using with two with both players, right? Okay, so I'm sorry, I'm not making funny or anything. It's just it's just kind of funny that I it, I'm laughing at myself for like making such a big deal about that point <laughs> in my you know in my twelve um, uh, common errors kind of things, right? And then me assuming that I would never see it again, right? So yeah, don't use a one, everybody out there. Don't use A1. Repeat after me. You know, say it to yourself daily. There is no such thing as A1, right? And now somebody will find a, a, a proper use of it, right? And show, share it in Facebook and humiliate me, but that's fine. That's all fair. Okay, so this is working nice. You do not need A2 oboes uh, in the middle here, right? It, it, like what you're doing here is you're just making the G sharp louder than the, than the B octaves. A sounding B, right? Written C sharp sounding B. Okay, and then here, the problem here is, I mean, it's just really hard to to discuss this without discussing everything at once, right? Here you have this lovely build, kind of pushing everything forwards, you know, and then you get to this nice strong uh, downbeat here. I mean, it's it's a little strange because like. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you, you complete these lines on the downbeat, but it doesn't really have a lot of weight to it. But that's all right. You got the timpani in there, right? So ending on fortissimo, pow. Everybody could be fortissimo here, right? Just try to go for more uniform 
dynamics, except for maybe in in certain textures with uh, brass against winds and so on. Really soft texture, brass against winds and, and strings, it, it doesn't matter so much um, about about marking the brass down. You don't have to do that. But in really loud textures, the brass tend to shout over the winds and the strings. All right, that's a different issue. Okay, but the real issue that I'm having between these two parts is right here, the melody is beautifully clear. You can really, really hear it. Just, it, you know, it just rings out. I mean, so clear. And then right here, like this sort of pluck, pluck, pluck. I mean, it does, doesn't seem to really... You know, and, and I understand the whole idea of an echo and so on, but the pizzicato is, you know, is such a weak element. And then, like, it really almost feels as if this, as if this line here that you wrote, it's beautiful, by the way, this line here in the cellos is, and then being answered by the bassoons. I mean, that's such a cool idea, but it is stronger in tone weight than your actual melody. Right? So if you want your melody to come through here, I would say double it with staccato oboes, right? Or something, something. because it just, just sort of feels like the melody is absent here. And, you know, I, I mean, especially in the face of, of horns and timpani, right? Even though they're playing softly, horns, timpani, counter melody in cellos and bassoons, I'm just not hearing the melody here, or the the significance of the melody in any way, and especially a pluck 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 pluck. It just it just doesn't come through very well, right? So consider some doubling in there by some instrument. I don't know, maybe clarinet or, right? You're pushing your bassoon quite high right in here. Um, it's just not all that strong up there. There are, you know, there are other instruments. I mean, if you, the 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 clarinet part right in here. Right, I mean, it's you're basically doubling. You're just doubling what's going on in the clarinets, and if that is all you're going to do, you might as well double it with an instrument that is that is nice and powerful, right? Like, like you could have that. You could have these notes played by your oboe, right? Or you could have just like you could have this pitch doubled by your second clarinet, right? Rather than sending up the bassoon to one tiny little. A up there. I mean, it's totally playable. It's just not all that powerful. You know, it's more like a, a chicken clucking, right? Rather than a than a kind of a punchy wind note. No offense to bassoonists. I love you guys. All right, so snare drum. Uh, this is kind of nice. This sort of push right in here, right? And then you have a glissando down and then a glissando up. Such a cool idea. And then you have like, you're running down and then running up. Kind of neat resonance. So that sort of takes us to the next question, looking at like how this is scored, these accompaniment patterns, right? Um, uh, accompaniment co figures covering a wide range. You break them up between the uh, wind instruments, which is nice. And then like right in here though, right? It, uh, you're just doing a little bit of pizzicato in your in your strings here against much, you know, like instruments that have more sustain to them, right? So I, I think that you would just need some kind of doubling from some instruments. And you know, you're sort of, you're using your middle winds right in here. And you just finished this featured line with a with the bassoon. So you're kind of stuck, you know what I mean? Um, so yeah, and then right in here, pluck, 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 pluck. Yeah, I, yeah, I just, yeah, see, you're going mezzo forte to fortissimo. You really are trying to bring this out, right? As opposed to the... And here you're saying tutti. Okay, all right. All right, so, see, so I see what's going on. See, so you're thinking a1 means use the first player, a2 means use the second player, and tutti means use both players. All right, so that's that's not a thing, okay? a2 means use both available players. a1 doesn't mean anything. Don't use it. Use the number one if you just want the first player, or the number two if you just want the second player. And then when you want both players to play, say A2, right? Don't say Tutti. All right, now that shows up in, say, like Berlioz's Symphony Fantastique score, like the first edition. Like they, they hadn't, you know, like this big, big scoring, they hadn't quite worked out what were going to be the standards yet, right? But nobody today says A2. Excuse me. <laughs> nobody today says Tutti instead of A2. And nobody says ah one, all right. So just right, and 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 furthermore, I just think about this. You have a piccolo player. I'm I'm thinking right, just one piccolo player, right. So why would you need to tell us that you're only using one of them, right? 
because there is only one piccolo player usually, right? So two flutes, one piccolo player. Maybe you're intending there to be a one flute player and one piccolo player. So like, you know, so you just have two flute family members, right? Two oboes, two clarinets, two bassoons, and one flute player and one piccolo player. And that's fine. But, you know, in that case, you also don't need to mention, right? If you only have one player on a part, you don't need to say anything about how many you're using at once. But when there are two, avail two available players on the same staff, then just tell us number one or number two or A2 for both players. And don't say 2D, all right? Okay. So, um, yeah, so I just feel that this needs to be stronger right in here. Now, as to the melody, so here you're trading off, and I would say have a dovetailing note. So trade off on the B. You know, da 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 B B and the same B da 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 da. I like I like that. I like the simplicity of it. Just really just direct, right? And then here, um, you have your middle winds bum bum ba da 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 da, and then coming right in on top. Yeah, da 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 bum 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 bum. That's really cool. I like the way that this is scored. This is nice. Um, so like kind of no problems in here except i would just watch out when you've got like this sort of nimble fingered uh left hand accompaniment style uh that you're sort of transcribing it from the piano when you add kind of low bass notes like this you know um i, I think you're i think you're are you intending a role here like you have like this sort of a continuous dynamic and and um dotted half notes so were you intending a role here because if you're not, then you should just mark, just mark, um, yeah, just mark quarter notes. The 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 hall will be the sustain of the instrument, right? Like even if the even if the timpanist like damps the the head of the timpani, right? He's like right here. You're just telling, saying, oh, we'll let the timpani head keep going, right? But even if the player damps the sound of the timpani, the hall will will have um, resonance from the timpani stroke, right? So it just kind of just doesn't make a lot of sense to have really long timpani notes. However, as a timpanist recently told me, <laughs> in time for me to put it into my last book, give us all the information, all right? Don't leave out any information. Like, whatever you want us to do, write everything in. That's what she would prefer, rather than, you know, she'd rather have parts that have too many, that are telling her too much, rather than just, you know, being incredibly sparse all the time. So just, you know, but just watch out because this really looks like it. Maybe it's intended to be rolled, right? Okay. So, um, but the, the overall point that I'm getting distracted from is that like when you're putting down this just really heavy grounding bass right in here, it has a tendency to sort of dis detract from the nimbleness. And, and right in here, like this, with this beautiful little accompanying pattern, which is very hard to double with anything in the other parts, maybe you could do it with staccato horns. But, you know, this this very, very sparse accompaniment right in here, by adding this, this kind of low stuff right in here with timpani, lower strings, and so on, uh, tuba, um, it has a, ten has a tendency to just really slow down the momentum of things, like just really drag it down. It's like, it's, or it's not really slowing things down, but it's just dragging down the energy, right? So it's just, you know, it's almost like, you know, you have this very peppy guy and he's hopping along the road and he's got his friend, like, and his friend has got like weights, like he's got those exercise weights on his ankles and he's just really tired and he's dragging his legs along, right? And they're trying to go the same speed, right? So, like, if you see those people walking towards you at the same speed, what is the, you know, even though there's this one guy who's very light on his feet, you'll see the other guy dragging his legs along, right? And it's the same thing. You hear it in the music. So just be careful about decisions like that, right? Okay, but otherwise, no big problems with this page. Now, going on to the next screen. Um, yeah, so this is kind of fun. I, I like the way that you've scored this. Plunk, plunk, plunk. Yeah, da, 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 da. See, like, yeah, I mean, you can get, you can achieve a lot with staccato bowing, right? Without having to go to pizzicato. And then you can hear, like, things like harp rolls and so on. So you've got enough room in here if you back off your 
let's say back everybody off to mezzo forte, right? You should you should not have fortissimo winds and mezzo forte strings. Like nobody's going to hear the strings, right? It's just all going to be about these piercing, these piercing loud screaming winds up here. And then even here, you're kind of suggesting maybe you forgot to put mezzo forte here. So let's just assume you're taking everything down to mezzo forte here, right? So like the harp becomes beautifully audible because there is no other plucking sound to interfere with it. And here you're just compensating. Now, I feel that while this is perfectly playable by your first trombone player, it's really more of a of a trumpet duo part right in here. I think just in terms of balancing the parts and playing perfectly in sync, you're going to get a way better result with two trumpet players, right? Uh, you know, and, and, and I mean, it's, yes, it's perfectly possible for the trombone player to play up to that high B. That is not the issue at all. It's just a matter of evenness, of just beautiful, perfect evenness. And you're going to get that with two trumpet players playing, right? And much more than you're going to get it with a trumpet player and a trombone playing. But the thing is that, like, no matter what you intend here, you are really going to not have balance, right? You're going to have mezzo piano, let's say crescendo, let's say they just get a little bit louder, maybe sort of like to almost forte. And then your oboe and clarinets come in and, you know, maybe they're still mezzo forte or maybe they're now fortissimo or something. Um, yeah. The projection and weight of the brass, even taken back a little bit, are still going to be much more penetrating than the winds right in here, right? So so I would say start from piano here, right? Piano, crescendo, and then I would say leave this at mezzo forte, right? And then come in at mezzo forte here and then do a further crescendo into this. And then I think you have a really nice balance. Anyways, so that's my take on your score, Lou. Um, uh, I really, you know, just really appreciate you being part of this. Um, you know, just, you know, it's great to get a score that, um, you know, just completely turns things upside down. It has lots of trading off and, and has a fairly simple um, orchestration in terms of like the structure, right? There's, it's, it's not to say that there's anything that is simple about, you know, what you, the effort that you took to score it or anything like that, but just more that, you know, you have a you have a more limited palette of sounds, and then that sort of allows the more intimate qualities of the instruments to speak out more, right? And and it also allows for more subtle interplay between parts and between sections and so on. So you know, it's it's good to get that alongside, you know, obviously more complicated massive tutis and things like that. So it's really great to get that contrast, um, and and you know, and also just just like all the inventiveness of it is is really refreshing and and you know and and you kind of can state the ideas just as well right so so just really thanks for an intriguing score and um and also you know just for being part of the big <laughs> the big conversation here between arrangers you know even if it's not always verbal but you know having said that please leave a comment for your mates in this um in this group that would be awesome below and you know everybody else please give Lou some constructive comments and everybody else as well all right so on to the next score Another score that's got a lot of variety and interplay and a lot of backed off textures, uh, some, some quieter moments and some really lovely contrasts of dynamics and so on. Uh, yeah, just, just really, really enjoyed this, Clayton. So, all right, <laughs> let's discuss a few things, all right? Jus de timbre and xylophone, all right? 
You, you know, that's funny, like your xylophone almost sounded like a glockenspiel to me at times, right? So, I mean, if the effect is going to be more or less the same, maybe it could just be the same instrument if you had to, like, economize. Um, but, I mean, yeah... I, I thought it was kind of interesting, like you've got this triple F right in here. And then things backing down to mezzo piano by here. And like, it really sounded, you know, in the mock-up, I couldn't hear the xylophone at all. So, so that's something you might want to adjust, you know, just have it be the same dynamic, right? If we're thinking triple F, maybe have forte right here. So triple F, double F, forte. So have it forte here. And then... Um, mezzo piano to mezzo forte, so I say mezzo forte here, and then piano there, All right? So otherwise I just, or mezzo piano right there, otherwise it just kind of doesn't stand out very well. And if you got these other, like, um, high, bright kinds of sounds, it, it will swallow up the xylophone in the mock-up or in the, um, in the playback, in, or excuse me, in, on stage. Okay. Uh, so, <clears throat> there was this other thing I wanted to talk about. Yeah, and that is, um, you're sort of using, like, the clash between G-sharp and G-double-sharp. Um, or F-double-sharp, I should say. It's G-double-sharp in the, in the clarinet part. So, and you've got that here. You've got the... Um, you got the G sharp here and you got the G natural there. So like, I think if you have a situation where one, um, one group of players is playing a sharp and the other group of players is playing a natural, then probably the best approach is to write like a parentheses natural over the, on the parts that are playing the natural part. Okay. Just so that it's like, it's really, really clear. Because like the the um, the violas will be sitting there like strumming along and playing, you know this this type of E major voicing, and then an octave higher, your second violins will be sitting around strumming an E major voicing as well, but with a G natural, right? So you really have to tell the copyist, the conductor, the players, right? That, um, that there is a G natural in the second violins. And you might even want to put a note on the score saying, uh, parentheses, like in the viola part, say G natural in second violins, right? And that just lets them know that they don't have to raise their hands at rehearsal and say, hey, excuse me, like, I swear, like, I, do I have this wrong? Do I, I have a G sharp in my part, but he's playing G natural, right? And this is something that the conductor may even actually just say at the beginning of the rehearsal. It's just like, um, you know, um, violas, uh, second oboe, you guys are playing G sharp. Uh, other other parts are playing uh, G natural or F double sharp or written G double sharp in the, in the case of the clarinets. So don't worry about it. It is just in the score, right? Now, I mean, if you intended that, <laughs> that's a very cool effect. But if you just suddenly thought, oh, oh, geez, you know, I just couldn't figure out what was wrong there. I was, I was taking the pitch of the grace note and I was, you know, just sort of making that into the pitch and like everything just sounds wrong. I don't understand why. Well, that's why, right? Um, what does Faya intend? He actually doesn't, you know, he actually intends like a G sharp, not a G natural, right? Like that's, that's, the the F double sharp or G natural in harmonically, um, that is intended as like a note that is is right under the the major third and and it is sort of rising up into it from a grace note right in the original piano part. So what really what he wants is you know, rather than the both of the notes to play together at the same time in the same place, but you know that is. You know, that is totally up to you. So, okay, this is strange. Pizzicato e battuto. And then... Okay, so, like, I, I don't understand. So, pizzicato e battuto. And then you have an X head note. And then you have a snap pizzicato. Right, so... 
and then there's this and then the so i don't understand like what does what does the x no note head mean does that mean pizzicato and battuto and then this is a normal pizzicato note so this is pizzicato that is battuto that is snap pizzicato so i mean i mean like or like you want some players to be playing pizzicato and others to be playing um you, you know um colenio battuto so it's just really unclear. You need to clear that up, okay? All right, so <laughs> with all that said, let's go to the evaluation criteria. Okay, so uh, pitch weight in the upper middle register of the piano, not a big concern. That's not limiting you. You are widening the scope of your scoring. And what's cool is you're, you're varying it. Like, you know, here uh, you have pitches that are closer to just the piano score, right? Continuing for about eight bars. And then here you have a broadening of your sound picture, and then you pull back a little bit, and then you widen it again, right? So, so that's all really cool. Um, for the most part, though, like overall, even though like this is huge scoring, and anybody who looks at this is going to say, "Wow, what a you know, monstrously big scoring." The actual truth is that you don't really go all that much below middle C very, you know, I mean, like, yeah, you have this stuff going on in the basses, but that's, you know, it's very minimal sounding stuff, you know. It, snap pizzicato is pretty loud on a double bass. Colonia battuto, very soft. You, know, you can mark it fortissimo as much as you want, but you just kind of hear this slight kind of slapping sound, you know. It really doesn't have that much power. If you really want that snapping sound, then there are percussion instruments there are plenty of percussion instruments that will get like the kind of the kind of slapping colonio battuto sound um you could like uh like a, a lower wood block or uh or like a whip <laughs> or that's a, that's a, that's really really loud though um or um there are like a, a log drum like played with uh, lighter sticks there's just a bunch of different things that are way louder than the sound of a double bass playing colenio battuto. All right. Uh, apologies, there might be some slight construction noises in the background. I'm, I'm doing this on a Saturday afternoon. And uh, we've been on semi-lockdown here in New Zealand. Um, we're actually not so bad here in Wellington. It's really, it's very, very much restricted in Wellington, excuse me, not so bad here in Wellington, but it's very restricted in Auckland. And um, but people are still kind of staying close to home, not going out that much, and they're getting kind of buggy. So people are, you know, they're doing all the things that they do on a Saturday, but maybe a little more so. All right, so back to this score. Um, let's just go to the next criterion, and that is thematic material repeating often, possibly sounding repetitive. You you just really totally change things around like the only thing that is doing the same thing as before are the the big pizzicato uh triple stops right but here you're even at that you're adding more texture to that right so everything really changes around in both of these four bar groups right and that's that's excellent now um as to the scoring of those parts it, you know it's it, it works pretty good I, I like the e flat clarinet you know, I'm sounding the high B. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, you've got a lot of weight on other parts and so on around it, right? But I mean, but it, it it's all spread out just very naturally with not a ton of doublings in other parts. So, uh, you know, you know, in this case, it's you don't. I don't think you need to double that E flat clarinet with any other wind part. All right, now here you're saying to your, um, like you want your second flute player to be going, yeah, da, dun, dun, dun. But, you know, that's the first player's job, right? If, if nobody is playing, um, you know, if there, if there is a theme to be played and nobody else is around, then it's really the first player's job. I would give this to the first and all of this to the first until we got to here. Just really think of the second player as a support player, right? Occasionally giving them something to do, but mainly so that the first player can rest their chops, right? Okay. So in you know, right here, wow, there's a lot of weight on on F double sharp. You know, you've got you know A two 
F double sharp in uh, flutes, oboes, you know, and yeah, and even and even with your um, with your E flat clarinet, you know. I mean, there's just so much weight on that. You, you're quintupling the weight on that pitch. Uh, yeah, just, you know. I mean, and you can hear it in the mock-up. Like, the, that's stronger than these, um, these octave Bs, which will be very pointy, by the way. They just really stand out. Um, in almost a kind of an accordion kind of a way, or, you know, kind of a hornpipe sort of a way. But, you know, you've also got the, um, you've also got your horns. Ah, oh, two horns. So, you know, so here is where I would have, like, on this high line right in here, I would have the, uh, the first and third playing this melody together. You know, that's the kind of thing where you bring in the third player. You know, they're, they're, they're a high, they're a substitute high player and they are really, really good on this big, high heroic stuff, right? And better to, you know, have the second, I would say, have the second horn player play these D sharps, written D sharps, right? Along with the fourth horn player. That's where I would depart on this, right? And then right in here, like you have the pitches reversed, right? So like the, in a, in a four note chord voicing between your four horns, the uh, second player should be playing the lower middle pitch, right? So this B should be a second horn note, and then the C should be a third horn note, right? So that they're interlocking. Now here, they're both playing A, a sharp, so that's not a big deal. And then here, do you intend for this to be A2 in both parts? So you, whether it's A2 or it's just first and third, you've got to tell me, right? So I, I think that's where you... Um, yeah. And then, yeah, so first, and then you got all three on a chord. First, all three in a chord. Okay, get rid of the um, of the mutes. And then here you say first and second. And then here you're saying first and then second and third. And, and okay, if you're going to do that, I would say have this line be in second voice. Okay. All right, and then A3 here, that's all good. Now, second and third, yeah, I see. And then you're bringing in that. And, and once again, I would have this in second voice. So have the second and third part in second voice and then, then have the rest above. It's just clearer to the conductor and the copyist and the score reader. So just have the, you know, the... the um, and, and this would also be like, I would say, continue the second voice below, right? So you have A3 all together and then... Ending here, first voice and second voice, the second voice implying second and third. And then you don't even have to mark this. You just have that, that second voice continue on, right? And then you can just drop out here and then just say second below. Um, and the first vo the first player will be playing the um, stems up and the second stems down and so on, right? And then here you can just come back to um, second. I would say come back to second and third because like they're all they're all just going to be placed in those registers and just really easy to kind of stay in them. Okay, <clears throat> all right. So, but let's get back to our criteria, right? Um, the the second concern was melodic development soaring quite high, um, along with accompaniment figures covering a wide range. So. Just talking about the accompaniment figures first, I feel that maybe you just need a little bit more. I mean, here you've got, here you've got some of that. I, mean, I think it just could be a little stronger in your strings. Like if you're going pizzicato, I think there could be more going on. Uh, violas could be more part of the active conversation in here, right? But I, I really love the use of the E-flat clarinet in there and the two oboes. I think they, they, this is all working together in an excellent way. And then the bassoons coming in. That works really, really nicely. Uh, and then, like, just sticking with the melody. Um, it's nice to have, you have that little harmonic note, right? And then... Dun, 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 dun. This is great. The octaves. Yep, up, 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 up. And just the first right in here, dun, 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 dun. Yeah, it's really nice. 
just nicely done. Okay, and then um, to stick with the melody, this is really great, the compromise right in here. That's nicely done. Okay, and then here you drop down. I would say, you know what, if you jump all, if you're going to go all the way up to high C here, then and then drop down to D, the sudden drop off from high C to this D is going to be very, very audible. All right? Just like suddenly the suddenly the the line will lose power, right? So it is better for you to jump down like here. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, bum, 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 bum. or or even just, you know, go to I mean, even just maybe this could all be A2 instead of A3. This could just be A2 going up to this F sharp, right? Because I just, yeah, like I just feel that that's a, that is, you know, one of the first clumsy things I've seen you do, right? Everything is really elegantly done. Here, I feel just, you know, it's like you're going up to this point where the instrument starts to scream and then all of a sudden they're playing softer and lower, right? So that could be fixed a little, either just like even all the way back here, starting on middle C or maybe jump down here to, you know, this could be A3 starting from here or even just A2. It doesn't need to be A3. Okay. But getting back to the accompaniment figures, yeah, once again, I just feel there needs to be a little more, just a, just a little bit more support in both way, you know, on both sides, right? Just, yeah. I kind of wish you had a um, an English horn in there because that would help you solve a lot of different problems that I'm seeing here and there. Just, you know, just places where, <clears throat> you know, you can, you could, you could um, kind of keep the texture a little bit more in the middle on some things, but I, it's just too much to get into right now. Okay. Um, like, for instance, like the English horn could be taking some of these higher bassoon notes, right? Or some of the lower clarinet pitches right in here. All right, anyways. So you're going all the way up here to triple F. And you know what? I don't think you need to do that, okay? Um, I think it would be better for you to go to forte here and then fortissimo, hmm. Okay, forte here, right? and then back off and then come back to fortissimo in all the parts. Because like, you have to think like, what does triple F mean, right? And in my way of thinking, uh, triple F is as loud as you can play on your instrument musically, right? And then quadruple F is, is as loud as you can play on your instrument non-musically, right? Um, you know, it, it's just just like it's like the the sound is kind of losing its sense, and then quadruple F would just be basically the loudest noise that you can produce, having nothing to do with any particular pitch, right? Okay, so I don't think it's necessary to go all the way up to this massive, massive sound. Although, you know, having said that, like the way that you balance everything else, like you know, having all of the space, you know, soft, like you know, piano to crescendo to fortissimo and back and so on and just you know having some space and so on so why not have a little space in here and then you can go back to, to fortissimo in your uh winds and strings and forte in your brass right anyways it's just a thought but I, I just think that really screams if you really go all the way to triple f but then you don't stay there you just like immediately diminuendo down to mezzo piano so maybe there just needs to be a little bit of a rethink here about the dynamics I mean, it's just so, so loud that you just can't, you know, you can't hear the uh, jeu de timbre very well. And I, I'm not really seeing anything here in the jeu de timbre that, that couldn't be played by, uh, just just perfectly by uh, glockenspiel. So, you know, if you were doing things that were a little bit more intricate, then maybe it would work, you know, just like some complex patterns or, you know, some really fast runs and so on. I would, I would recommend the jeu de timbre, but I don't really see you know, a huge need for it as opposed to just a standard uh, glockenspiel. And then that's probably what you get most of the time. Okay, so we're rushing all the way up to here. So, there, you know, another possible rationale for not getting too screamingly loud is just to be aware that the phrase here is not 
e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e having a lot of weight and then just dropping down, right? You don't need to start the diminuendo. You could just, you could go up to fortissimo and then drop to forte, right? And then, then this would be a lot easier to balance. It'd be less distance to go and it wouldn't be so extreme, right? And like, you know, and then just sending the trumpet all the way up to this A, right? Just really, I mean, you know, considering how high you're pushing everything else in the winds, you know, clarinets like e e flat clarinet and so on that's that's okay to throw in that a in there it's that's not a that's not a big deal all right but like the the strings are pretty light right in there compared to the winds um yeah but i mean it's okay i mean it's it this this i don't have any big complaints about this corn or anything Yeah, and so that just leads to, like, the last four bars. Uh, maintaining a driving staccato. You know, we got the oboes. I just really love, like, our soli oboes right in here. That's so cool. And then, like, trading off to Atu oboes and B-flat clarinets, right? And, and, the, and the strings just eventually insinuating themselves into the sound picture. Now, you know what you could do here is you could have an even more of a gradual insinuation like mezzo piano mezzo forte right and then start piano right and then everybody end up at mezzo forte and then just eventually like what happens is the strings start to take over and fill in but they don't they aren't so obviously starting together right it's like one one of the problems with the way that you've got it scored now is the equality of dynamic strength of the winds to these parts means that that they you know you you're going to hear the strings starting you're going to hear them joining in right rather than insinuating themselves right so i would just say start with a softer dynamic let them let this texture gradually become a blended texture and i think it's that's just so much more powerful and like you know it it also like just it keeps the whole idea of the you know, the wind voices being solely going for just another bar, even though by the time you get to right here with my cunning plan, the strings are already becoming an important part of the sound picture. Yeah. All right. So, um, yeah. And then I'm just not sure what's going on with these slashes, but, but yeah, really cool. I, I really love this score. Um, it just really gave me a lot to talk about. There's way more that I could pick apart about it, but I think that that's probably good enough. Um, yeah, it just really some cool ideas, like putting your clarinets above your oboes and things like that, and just sort of doubling them with the um, with the flutes and so on. Just, yeah, just really, you know, this is just going to be very, very powerful compared to anything that's going on in the strings, right? And then right here, I, I don't see... The, any need for the seconds to be playing um, over like voice crossing with the first this is a second violin part and this is a first violin part and you know as nice as you want to be to your second players uh, you know it's really just better in this if you're going to be this screamingly loud with your wins then you, you, you better give it this to the strongest players right or even or have both players you know both groups of violins doing this and not worry about these other pitches, which are just doubling pitches in your in your winds, anyways, right? Okay, well, those are my thoughts on that. I could see I could just pick this apart forever to talk about the uh, uh, the uh, the horns and the trombones right in here and all these other things. But I think that I think you get the idea, right? And so you you've got enough things you can think about and so on. So you know what a cool score. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, and. You know, just easier right in here to have a triple beam. Um, yeah. Just it's just a lot clearer, rather than the trill mark. It's kind of an kind of an older fashioned sort of thing to do on a percussion part. 
It's, it's the, see, this is the kind of thing that can easily get like buried, cut off at the top of a page, mistaken for something else because the because the line above it sort of intrudes downwards and so on. When you have the triple beam on this on the stem of the note, it's like absolutely clear. There's there's almost no way that that could be mistaken for anything else. All right, well. I'll, I'll shut up now. I just keep wanting to pick away at your score here, Clayton, and, and it's worth picking away at and really, really enjoyable. You know, thanks so much for being a part of this challenge and a part of this collection um, of, uh, of scores. I think that there's a certain complementary uh, feature to all the scores in this, and we'll see why in our final score coming right up in just a second. Very clever, Villiers. So, in case people are sort of missing what's going on here, the score has been reinterpreted into G minor, <laughs> um, but with uh, three flats, right? And uh, then the uh, B natural here is is sort of fighting with that minor third, that the minor third of B flat in the key signature. Okay, well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so there's a ton of things to fix here, but like the general concept of the music is really brilliant and just really fun, and uh, I just really love the reimagining that's going on here. Okay, uh, so let's talk about the harp. Okay, so okay, près de la table, it doesn't matter how près de la table you are with your harp here. It is the sound of the harp is going to get swallowed into the pizzicato strings. There's just no way around it. There's no way to avoid it, right? They the so if you wanted the harp to have some kind of role in what's going on here with the pizzicato, then you should forget about the bass clef, score everything up here in like uh, higher chords. They don't have to be very big. I would say to avoid something big, but maybe the lowest note, or the lowest note should be no lower than this D here, right? So it just has to have this, and it and it could be like a, like you know, it could be like a G major chord, right? Um, uh, uh, voiced uh, D G B natural, you know, and maybe even higher, right? But just and make it rolled instead of this um, instead of this grace note idea, right? So. Uh, something like that will actually come through. Um, and the other thing I'd recommend to like just to really preserve this, like to, to get some harp in this, mark it fortissimo, près de la table, and then everybody else forte as the loudest dynamic, right? So forte pizzicato, you forgot, we left out a dynamic here. Forte pizzicato, piano crescendo to forte, or excuse me, piano crescendo to forte, right? Uh, and then your harp has a chance, and also just forte castanets and timpani. It's a little strange, right, when you're throwing in this, like, F and A uh, double stop, right? So um, I don't know if you've had a chance to read my chapter in 100 More Orchestration Tips about uh, about timpani double stops. Um, and they, they can be quite effective if they're they're very isolated. Um, and you can, and the ear can really pick out the, um, the, uh, the subtleties of the pitches, um, but in, in this case, like the you know the the F and the A, that quality will you know, it'll just really sound more like um, it'll really sound more like an A, um, or it, it'll be a little unclear, right? So like the closer together you get in pitch with your double stops, the less clear they are, and like and and if they aren't perfect intervals. Um, or sixths, then they like thirds tend to, like unless unless the sound is very isolated in timpani scoring, the um, thirds will tend to sort of cloud in terms of their their um, their identity will tend to be 
kind of murky. All right, um, and the, just the same comments here. Uh, now, you know, as to right in here, like, there's just so much weight in the melody here. The the maybe if the harp were scored atava in both hands, there would be a chance of this coming through somewhat. And then right in here, um, if you kept the harp scoring very high, like these lower notes right in here will get swallowed by what everybody else is doing. And especially with like uh, fortissimo brass, uh, you know, fortissimo strings and winds and so on, there, there really isn't a lot of chance for the, the harp part to be very clear right in here. And there, you know, you would have to think of some other way. Maybe pizzicato first violins would be better than, than harp right in here. Okay, so those are just a few scoring, a few thoughts about scoring. All right, now let's look at the evaluation criteria. There really isn't a big problem here with a lot of the basic, um, a, a lot of the basic precepts like you know, um, pitch weight in the upper middle register of the orchestra, that's not a problem. Thematic material repeating often, well, you know, this first part, it really does kind of do the same thing sort of twice-ish, twice-ish. There's a lot of, you know, kind of copy-pasting, more or less. I, I really shouldn't say that, you know, because a lot of people didn't copy-paste, they actually wrote everything out, and there are like little variations and so on um, that make more sense when you think about the very slight variations in the piano score. But still, you know, the overall effect is that's just the same thing happened four times in a row, right? The same two bars were repeated four times in a row. Uh, so so the, the thing about it is, though, that like in the context of the entire, <laughs> this entire run of evaluations, uh, it's just so different what you've done in the first four bars that repeating it the second four bars is not such a big deal. And of course, like, of course, with, with the piccolo on top and so on, the clarinets coming in to thicken at the end, there's there's some... So I was just thinking, like, if there's some way of... Uh, some way of, of maybe just adding a little bit more of a change in this. Now, before I was talking about altering a bunch of things in order to make the heart more audible and so on, like altering the dynamic scale but I would say actually what if you just drop the harp entirely and just realize the harp part in the first violins right and then here they can go to they've got plenty of time to go to arco on this it's kind of interesting that you start in a little early like an eighth note early and it's very audible you know da 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 it's really you know just that early start is very very obvious both times right so it doesn't call attention to itself a little too much. You have to be the judge of that. Anyways. Um, so, I mean, the scoring basically works. I would just say get rid of the harp. Give the, give you know, the, the left-hand part is already being more or less realized by the cellos. Uh, with, you know, the difference being like a different, a different note, a different grace note. Um, you know, just about pizzicato grace notes. Um, it might be better to score it as a, uh, just to score this as an interval and a roll, right? Rather than as a grace note, you know, better, might be better to just have like a, a D octave with a, uh, with a little roll mark, right? I think that that just works a whole lot better, just visually and, you know. And just in terms of like the technique, I mean, the technique is the same. It's just, I think it's just more natural. Like for me as a viola player, I'd rather see this as a, you know, I'd rather see this as, as an interval with a, with a roll mark myself. And then here you can have a downward roll, right? So here's where I would recommend a arrow pointing down roll, right? Because it, it's backwards to the, um, it's uh, backwards to the default, but you just leave the default regular uh, roll lines in here without the arrow, without the upward arrow that's just not needed. All right. Okay, and then here you've 
chosen to just kind of really keep the line, the melodic development from getting too high, right? So even here, when you bring in the piccolo to thicken this up, um, you, you know, yeah, but da 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 you know, you just, you just don't get all that high. Now, having said that, you could push the oboes all the way up to F. You could just, if you want to just keep your oboes playing, um, I guess this is A2. You don't really tell me if this is thirds and then going to A2, thirds going to A2. I'll just assume that that's what you mean. Okay. Um, so yeah, so your oboes could easily continue to double. They'll, they'll sound very thin going up to the that high F, but it's perfectly playable and you don't need to go to piccolo here, which is way weaker than the oboe, right? Like, you know, by the time you get up to this F, the F is starting to sound strong, right? You're starting to get into the stronger register of the piccolo, but everything in the staff is, you know, is just kind of weak. Um, I, I, think the, I think the piccolo, even though it's getting, excuse me, I think the oboes, even though the oboes are kind of going to get thin going up to the F as well, um, they would be... I just think they would contribute more than piccolo right in here. And especially like this D is just almost almost invisible. Okay. <clears throat> and here, you know, you're you're basically you're you're addressing the whole question of the um of the accompaniment figures covering a wide range just kind of with this approach right in here with your bassoon and English horn. Okay, and that's all cool, uh, and and I really like this walking bass right in here. I'm just not sure if the accompaniment is strong enough, right? See, like here you got this ya ba da 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 da, um, you know, and and it doesn't really have a lot to play off of da da da. And so it's like in the piano part, it's da 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 bum, ending on something, right? Da 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 ba bum da 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 ba bum. So I'm just really not getting that same sense from the way that the accompaniment is scored, though I love the walking bass. I think it's really awesome. Don't get rid of that, but just maybe, you know, go back to, I would say go back to the drawing board a little bit on the on the accompaniment style, see if there's more that you can add in terms of the rhythmic complexity and interest. You know, there's a bunch of pizzicato strings that aren't doing anything, right? Okay. Now here in the second run, yeah, this is all doable. And since you've changed the key, right? You know, you're not going up to uh, piercingly high E with your flutes. You're just going, you know, all the way up here to this um, high G right here, right? So. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's doable on clarinet. No problem. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, just really simple scoring. And I love the push right in here of the um, of the bassoons and uh, and your horns. Really, really nice. So. Uh, then you get into this territory right in here, and you know, similar to a, a previous score, it really just becomes about the brass, right? You know, you, you are you are scoring your brass in in very strong registers, fortissimo, and even though it's just horns and trumpets, man, it just just takes over the whole sound, right? You could just barely hear anybody else. You could possibly get away with just you know bassoons, contra bassoon, double basses, cellos, and the brass you've got here, and it wouldn't sound all that different, right? Because this, you know, this stuff up here, yeah, da 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 da. You just you've chosen not to double this part right in here, da 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 da, with any any strings, right? So it's really like your flutes and oboes could just go home right here because against this high trumpet here. They'll be invisible, right? They just uh, they'll they'll thicken the tone a little bit. You don't have to take them out, but still, it, they just don't have the same power as just a single trumpet up there. But you know, as you descend, they become more relevant. But I would say right in here, bump up, bump bum, bum, yeah. 
So, I mean, it's, it still is very different scoring. Like the, the whole concern about the upper middle register being relentless if there's no textural contrast. And it's, I mean, that's just not an issue here, right? It's, not only do you have a bigger scope of scoring, but you do have a big difference between the way things are scored in previous bars. So, I mean, it, it all works out really great. Just, just I would just say watch the balance. You know, if you really intend the winds and strings to have a meaningful role in here, um, you know, just just maybe. I mean, I, I mean, I like the way you're just punching the beginning and the ending of the of each little three bar rhythmic phrase. Hmm. Anyways, it's it's not an easy problem to solve. All right, continuing on. Molto marcato, maintaining a driving staccato. I mean, this all works great. It's just like, do you want everything to be so paced? Right? Do you want it to be but da 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 but da 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 but da 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 da? And you're just like really telling us where this is, and and yeah, and do you really want da 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 da? So the thing about it is, in the original piano score, it really is just these two lines, right? And it's just like this, you know, a little bratty kid running down the street, and you know, their mum running after them, right? Hey, come back! You know, they this there's nothing. They have no control. They're just going to keep running until they run into the next episode, right? And but like with the way that you've got it scored here, we're really it's like really timekeeping. We're really kind of keeping track of and, and even like in here, you know, with the cast notes going click 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 click, you know, it's just really kind of keeping keeping everything really timed, right? So you just have to ask yourself whether or not you feel that regularity is relevant, right? And of course, like we don't have. An example of what's coming next but <clears throat> I mean it does feel like it's leading to something meaningful and like if you were to take some of these approaches you know, some of this real original kind of mindset and apply them to the next section then I think that yeah I mean I, I could really see this going to somewhere right so if you have real strong ideas about what this should be then don't let me stop you I think that that's fine right but just like in the spirit of the passage itself, do we need to have so much pacing is what you would need to ask yourself. And of course, like the, the, the harp should be much higher or just not, or maybe not involved because it's, it's just too, it cannot compete with this, with the bigger scoring. <clears throat> there was this one other thing that I wanted to mention. I'm sort of thinking about too many things at once. All right, yeah, it's it's right here. So like, all these pitches right here, these tied eighths. The reason why they were tied, if you didn't watch some of the earlier evaluations or the earlier evaluation when I mentioned this, um, they are tied because the thumb is playing this note right in here, or the sorry, the little finger of the left hand is playing this and then their index finger is playing this note and then the little finger is playing is kind of playing right back on the uh on the e again and holding it so it's da -da -da and then the thumb is coming in and playing this e up above right so that is why fire is tying these notes but they don't need to be tied for your orchestral players because they're not using a keyboard right so what they want is this Right? This is how they want to read that. Oops. I did that wrong. Right? This is what they want right in there. Right? This that that would be preferable. Okay, so um <laughs> with that, I think I will wrap this up. I think you did a great job here, Villiels. I think that is just an amazing approach. Uh I just really love the the trumpet scoring right in here, I think that's brash and, and bright and lovely and the support of the horns, just great scoring. Really, really nice stuff. And yeah, yeah, I mean, such fresh ideas in this and, and a real great capstone to everything that has happened before in this set of evaluations. Just really strong and, and, and enticing material, a, a great variation, even like at the beginning, like the first three entries were really big in their scoring, but they were 
all big in different ways. Just you know, They did not sound like one another at all. And then here towards the end, we've gotten more light in the in the weight of a lot of the uh, a lot of the parts of the passages but still you know just really interesting and different all the way through and that has just been the case with <laughs> if you you guys are just making this all worthwhile just from like a programmer's standpoint it's it's gold right uh, for me as a uh, as just owning a channel or running a channel and and getting fresh content on there there, you know, if you are somebody who's interested in orchestration, then this will be just a, you know, it'll be a gold mine because there's so many different things happening here. So, I mean, I can I can see these videos being watched by future generations, um, people just getting ideas or or getting some perspective on their own efforts, or maybe you know maybe people will do these um, do these challenges themselves in the future after we're all gone, and. You know, maybe a class will will just have the assignment, the same assignment that I gave everybody at the beginning of these challenges, and um, you know they'll all do it, and then they'll all watch some of these evaluations afterwards and think about some resonances in their own scores, and hopefully their scores will be just as unique and individual and and as expressive of the personality of each orchestrator as these were. So thanks all. Thank you so much to everybody for participating in this evaluation and for all the participations, participants, excuse me, for all the participants of all these evaluations. Um, huge thanks. Uh, thanks for all the comments that you're leaving. And, you know, just as I said before, everybody who's involved with this, please comment on each other's scores. It just makes a huge difference. Um, at the beginning of this uh, at the beginning of this, I said, you know, with 165 entries, we should have thousands of comments, and that is coming true. But, you know, getting into the final run is when I'm when in previous years, comments have fallen off just because people are starting to get, you know, a little uninvolved and, you know, and, and starting to get interested in other things. Let's not let that happen. I'm keeping up a really fast pace with the releases. With these releases, I'm you know I, I don't think I've ever worked so hard on anything <laughs> in this kind of vein before. So I'm keeping up the pace. You guys keep up the comments, right? And we're going to get to the end of this by the end of this month. Thanks everybody so much, and I will see you very soon for another video of great entries.